Welcome to episode two of The Brainstorm. I'm Sam Koris, ARC's Director of Research for Autonomous Technology and Robotics, and joined by Nick Gruss, the one of the Associate Portfolio Managers at ARC Invest. Today, we're talking about Reddit blackouts. We're talking about Toyota's new EV strategy, LVMH and Epic Games, digital fashion shows, mutant rice from China that could really change the world in a great way. Uh, and then lastly, we've got a BlackRock filing for a Bitcoin uh, ETF. So Nick, let's dive in. What's, what's happening with these Reddit blackouts here? Yeah, Reddit blackouts or Reddit protests. Reddit is really revolting over a new change, over charging for uh, the API that Reddit has. A lot of third-party clients use it. Uh, app developers have built uh, applications for Reddit. Um, there's a lot of e there's a big ecosystem around Reddit's API. Um, so rewind the clock two months ago, back early April, um, they decide that they're going to start charging for this. Over the next you know few months, there's discourse and 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 developers are are showing frustration over this new change in pricing. The the API was originally free. Now they're charging, I, I believe it's 24 cents per 1,000 calls. Um, there was one developer, uh, an app called Apollo, they posted on Reddit and they explained kind of the magnitude of this change. 24 cents may not seem like a lot, um, but they're calling on Reddit's API over 7 billion times a month, meaning that their end of year bill would be around 20 million dollars, which would really put them out of business, I believe. Um, so now, you know, we're in this week, um, June 12th comes around. This is the start of an organized protest against Reddit, against management, against this, this change in pricing. Um, over 8,000 um, subreddits signed up to go dark, meaning they're toggling over to private, not allowing the public to access these forums. And right now, there's a live tracker. You can see there's still 4,500 um, subreddits that have gone dark. And it was actually supposed to end earlier in this week. But there was a leaked memo, um, an internal memo that Steve Huffman, the CEO, put out, essentially downplaying the events, the significant of the the significance of the events, um, and this really upset the community even further. Um, so now a lot of these subreddits are going dark indefinitely. So Nick, you team Huffman or you team moderator here? What's what's the right right play? I wish I had a hot take, but I think I see both sides. I understand, um, you know. Huffman and, and management originally did this because they want to guard the, the data that they have against large language models. OpenAI uh, open um, had used Reddit in the past. I think they also used Twitter data to train these large language models that everyone is starting to use and pay for. And so Huffman management team, they said, hey, why are we giving this, this value away for free? Let's guard against that. They're also, uh, there's rumors that they're allegedly gearing up for an IPO. So they're looking for ways to drive revenue. But I also understand it from the community's perspective. When you anchor pricing around a freemium model, it's hard to charge anything <laughs> above that. And, you know, these communities have built an ecosystem through third party applications that have helped Reddit get to where it is. So the community feels like they have been overlooked, that they're not giving enough, that they've been not given enough respect in this in this instant. So I see both sides. What about, what about you, Sam? Um, I'm, I think I think I got a side with Huffman here. Right. I feel like you, you got to charge and I, I, you know, maybe we could go into what it means for large language models and software broadly here. But it's like how much of the content being created now is generated by these models? Like, do you just have tons of open AI posts that are filling it out? And then you're getting this like crazy feedback loop of pre open AI data and, you know, post open AI data. Uh, but at the same time, I think, it, you know, it's a risk. Communities move on from from other sites. Yeah, you have to. There's, I think, a, a balance you have to strike, especially when a community can be so vocal and has so much power. And I think that's one of the unique aspects of Reddit as a platform. They've handed a lot of the control over to the community, over to these moderators. Um, and so they have to work in, 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 in congruence with them to really build this platform up. And so it's something that not just Reddit has to be careful of, but a lot of platforms have to be careful of. So do you think this is like a, a MySpace or dig.com moment where the community moves on or are they staying the course? 
Yeah, I think in terms of MySpace, I like I don't see another platform breathing down Reddit's neck in the way that Facebook was really starting to uh, you know, push on MySpace and to be honest, I'm not too familiar with uh dig.com, so hopefully it, you know, Reddit doesn't go into oblivion like uh dig, which I'm sure a lot of people aren't familiar on. Um, but I don't see another competitor. I think you, Reddit is really, truly unique in the way that discourse happens there. The amount and, and depth of knowledge that you can find in these subreddit communities is really just, it, it's unique. You know, you say discourse there. The one name that I've heard thrown around as someone who could capitalize on this is Discord. Uh, can Can they capitalize while there are blackouts happening or you don't think it's necessarily competing directly with them? Yeah, it's interesting. I think they're competing at, at, at certain levels, but I also think that they benefit from one another. Reddit has a lot of archive data. Um, so, you know, one, one aspect of this is, you know, when Reddit has this uh, blackout period, how much is Google um, being impacted? Because a lot of Google searches will actually take you to Reddit. So that's kind of one area to, to think about. But I think in terms of discourse and a Discord and Reddit, you know, Discord is more real time communication where Reddit has that aspect, but it's really more archival posting um, that, you know, I think new users find find value in. The power users obviously, I think, use the platforms in very similar ways where they're communicating all the time. Um, but, you know, so there's aspects where they compete and aspects where they don't. All right, but they, great, I think but... they benefit from one another. I think they benefit from one another. Great. Let's move on to the next topic, Toyota's new EV strategy. And is it fatally flawed? Um, you know, maybe maybe I'm not bearing the lead there with our opinion. But so to give context here, Toyota, they had a sweeping change in management, new CEO. Uh, they've always been a bit slow to adopt electric vehicles. The new CEO comes in, says that, you know, they're going to move forward. They're going to update the strategy. This past week, they have a big announcement and they lay out their plans. One of the key plans to their EV strategy is solid state batteries uh, that would be available in 2027. Now for context here, this isn't the first time Toyota's talked about solid state batteries. In 2017, they said that they would have solid state batteries in electric vehicles by 2022. It's now 2023 and they're saying they'll have them by 2027. You know, for us, this is kind of just totally off base. And the right question to be asking here is, you know, what is the cost of these batteries in five years relative to the existing chemistries that exist today? Uh, and this isn't to say that these batteries aren't going to exist. You know, you can look, you know, we're showing the, the tweet now. Uh, solid state batteries are getting there. You know, we're going from just a couple gigawatt hours of production this year to roughly 30 gigawatt hours projected for 2026. Um, that's really only enough for 400,000 electric vehicles. And uh, really, you know, in our opinion, if you're going to use these batteries, which are probably more expensive at small scale, they need to offer a unique capability to make it really worth it. So where do solid state batteries make sense? You know, potentially in drones, in aviation, uh, maybe, you know, we talked about the Vision Pro last week, maybe in AR and wearables, things like that. Well, I, I have a few questions here because this is an area I know very little about. And you're, you're the expert because, you know, when I hear solid state battery, one, I want to know, like, what is the performance being offered solid state versus what out what is out there today? And what does solid state mean compared to the other chemistries being offered? I look at a Duracell battery. I look at, you know, the Tesla in my garage looks pretty solid to me. Like what exactly is solid state in this instance? I, most batteries look solid to me. So like I'm, you know, coming at it and I would love for you to explain this to me. Like, you know, I'm uh, in fifth grade cause that's kind of my knowledge base here. Sure. And I, I don't want to go too in the weeds right now as we're trying to rapid yeah. pace this, but uh, the big difference is in the electrolyte and really what people are trying to get is more energy dense. And so what does that mean? It means more energy per unit of mass. You know, this is particularly important, we think, for aviation, because if you're in the air, uh, then every pound really matters a lot. But I think what people uh, kind of overestimate is the importance on the ground. If you're on the ground, then it doesn't really matter as much how heavy the vehicle is. Obviously, it'll still impact it. But with the efficiency of regenerative braking, you actually recoup a lot of this energy. So 
you know, it takes energy to get something heavy moving, but then as you slow down, you can recoup it through running those motors in reverse. And so I think this is kind of, you know, looking at the problem and saying, oh, we need more range, uh, but attacking it in the wrong way. And then who else is going after solid state battery development? I'd love to know, like who, else, you know, you mentioned Toyota, who else is, who else is doing this? Yeah, so, you know, CATL is one of the biggest battery manufacturers out there. Uh, they've discussed this. There's already solid state batteries commercially available um, in pacemakers. So that's one application of them in the heart. Uh, you know, other novel chemistries are being used. I think the WHOOP, you know, the, the tracking band, they use uh, some next generation battery technology in there. Uh, and you can see kind of these first applications are not the automotive application. And this isn't to say that we don't think solid state will make its way into vehicles long term, but it just seems like the on ramp needs to be through uh, areas where the key cost component isn't the battery. Makes sense. All right, should we should we move on? Yeah, let's go. All right, LVMH, Epic Games, digital fashion yeah. show. Interesting partnership. I, you know, I'll, I'll set this up in saying that a lot of Epic Games, this is the creator of Fortnite, a lot of their partnerships and brand deals have been centered around Fortnite. This is a bit unique, and I'll, I'll read the press release. Uh, this is from LVMH to kind of set the stage and, and give you an understanding of what they plan to do. So to transform the group's creative pipeline and bring customers new types of immersive products and discoverable experiences, this strategic partnership will empower LVMH and its mansions to further utilize Epic's powerful 3D creation tools to offer experiences like virtual fitting rooms, fashion shows, 360 product carousels, augmented reality, creation of digital twins, and more. So this is using Epic's Unreal Engine 5 which is one of, it's their game engine, one of many game engines in the market, um, but probably one of the top game engines being utilized today. The fidelity, everything that this is capable of doing is, it's really mind blowing if anyone's ever seen some of the videos and maybe we'll have a picture up of, of what this uh, partnership will look like. Louis Vuitton dropped the photo with some digital uh, avatars walking around in, in LVMH clothing. <laughs> it's pretty interesting, um, but I think it's really, you know, we're at a unique moment in gaming because these tools, these services, these engines are being used outside of gaming. Um, this is one instance where you have, you know, this luxury uh, mega corporation beginning to use this engine to drive innovation in, in the way that they showcase and interact with, with their products. Um, but you also have Epic's Unreal Engine being used in TV and film. It's been used in over 550 TV shows and movies. That's when I heard that, that was like a mind blowing stat. I'd only really heard that it was used in the Mandalorian. And to me, it's like, okay, Disney forward thinking wanted to use this as kind of a, a test case, but no, it's being utilized in 550 TV shows and movies. And then I don't know if you know this, Sam, but it's actually being used to drive the infotainment system in Rivian, which I think, again, it's like, there's so many different applications for the game engines that are out there today. Epic's one instance, Unity also has its own um, product in the market. And we're starting to see other sectors utilize this technology, which is, oh, I think, a they, really they, fascinating piece. Time, yeah, so I, I get do, really do, excited do, about this. Do, do, does, is this just like one of those metaverse uh, fashion shows? Like, should I care? Or is this, you know, in the past? No, I think you should care. And I think what will be really interesting is when you potentially interact with something that's built on top of Unreal Engine and you have no idea that it's actually, you know, Unreal Engine driving that. So when you go to uh, one of the storefronts um, and look through their product SKUs and it looks, you know, like it was a photo taken of, of a high-end luxury bag, but it's actually a 3D rendering of the luxury bag being, you know, rendered by Unreal Engine 5. I think that's kind of what this is driving at. It's making these experiences indistinguishable from kind of what you see out there on the internet today. So I, I think it gets away from the kind of meta metaverse uh, vision where it's like very kind of uncanny valley. -y. What you're saying is this is the, <laughs> this is the real metaverse. This is, this is the real uh, metaverse that, that users won't know they're, they're interacting with. Gotcha. So that's good. 
All right, next topic. I think this is the biggest topic of the week. It's probably going to get the least coverage out there. I had to fight Nick to to even talk about this because he hates rice. But, uh, you know, this rice innovation that's happening, Nick, um, can you just kind of set the stage for how important rice is to the world? Yeah, and I did, I did in, in full transparency, fight with Sam on this. Um, but then I started looking into how important rice is to kind of the global food chain and, and, and to people out there. And I came up and came away with some pretty interesting stats that I'll, I'll use to set the stage. So this is according to one source, the New Humanitarian Organization. One fifth of the world's population or over one billion people depend on rice cultivation for their livelihood. To me, that's a pretty big figure. Um, didn't really understand the magnitude. And then this is another stat I found pretty interesting in terms of kind of the scale and and importance of this particular grain. Asia alone has 200 million rice farms. I mean, that's just, you know, unfathomable scale in terms of uh, at least what I was previously thinking. But yeah, I think, you know, it's, we're saying all of this to, to set the stage so people understand how, you know, how important this this innovation could be that we're going to get into right now. And, you know, one of the big problems with rice is there's uh, a number of diseases, but for rice, it's particularly bad. It's called rice blast. Uh, and rice blast destroys between 10 and 35% of the rice harvest each year. And so this is pretty uh, epic in magnitude. That's about $63 billion in annual loss. You compare that to, you know, some of the other agricultural diseases out there, like late blight, which is, you know, maybe a $6.7 billion annual loss for those crops. We've actually got the perfect person uh, to join us. Pierce, you you want to give a quick background on why you're the man for the job? He's our rice expert. And that's why, that's why you only see him as a, as a field. <laughs> right. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Sam. Uh, my name is Pierce Jamison. I'm part of ARC's multi-omics team, and I uh, did my graduate studies in plant pathology and microbiology. So this was kind of really right up my alley uh, in terms of news. So yeah, it's exciting stuff. And um, this, came, this this work came out of uh, the Huajong Agricultural University and in collaboration with UC Davis. And um, yeah, I think that, you know, we, we see a lot of these kind of innovations coming out of the agricultural field, but s- sort of a f- few of them are as important to me as, as this one potentially could be. Um, and essentially what happened was it's been known for a long time that when you delete certain genes uh, in crops, in this case, rice, you, you get disease resistance qualities. So in this case, they were looking at a gene called RBL1 or resistance to blast one. And that's, you know, they knew when they knock it out that you get disease resistance. But the problem is that RBL1 is this dwarf puny looking plant that doesn't make any rice really. And so everyone kind of thought it was useless. Um, and then this team, this collaboration, they uh, they employed a CRISPR screen where they used the CRISPR gene editing technology to sort of create 60 different variants of this mutant uh, gene at this one uh, gene location in the genome of rice. And, and they screened those many variants and they found one that not only had that, that disease resistance, you know, but also had the you know yield characteristics that you would hope for uh, from from rice and and actually in some cases better than normal like better than wild type yield um, and so this is like a very exciting thing just because you know rice blast especially with the changing climate has been a very very big concern among among farmers around the world so and so how long does this take to go from the lab to the field you know in batteries when we talk about next gen batteries you see something in a lab and you almost assume that it's never going to make it to commercialization. Right. What, what's it look like in the gene editing and agricultural world? Yeah. So, you know, like maybe a decade or two ago, this kind of thing to make its way into the field, in, into like a, 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 a grower's field near you, it would have taken six, seven years probably. But nowadays we have much more advanced tissue culture techniques and, um, and things can happen a lot faster. So I'm projecting something like 18 months, two years before this really, you know, disseminates. And, and you know, it's like 18 months for the the big agricultural conglomerates to pick it up and, and start integrating it into their into their lines and integrate the trait. And then probably uh, another six months to generate the seeds necessary to, you know, sell to farmers to, to plant in their own fields. So something like two years, I think, is probably what we can expect. And, um, you know, I don't know if they sell 
uh, two year out and, uh, puts on on rice futures, but you know, uh, that's uh, no 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 financial <laughs> no financial advice just kidding, no financial just kidding. advice. I'm just, I'm but, just making a joke but, about supply and demand. It it does seem kind Pierce's of crazy point. here. Sorry, Nick. It does seem kind of crazy here because I feel like often with these things, uh, it sounds technical. And so people tune out, but it is, it's like, this is the future, right? We've got mutant rights that's modifying gene editing rice blaster one uh, gene here. And now we're going to have uh, rice blast resistant uh, rice. And that's going to, you know, save 10 to 35% of the rice yield each year. I mean, it's pretty, pretty incredible. Rice blaster one is a new X-Men for, for the comic book. That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, but I, I mean, I think it's also... But it's exciting for me because like, you know, nowadays we've been seeing a plateau in terms of yield. So like before decades before uh, today, and actually just recently, you would you would see this consistent increase in the you know harvested mass per hectare, let's say. But like recently, it's just been plateauing. Like we haven't seen the same incremental improvements every year. Uh, and so what that means is in order to increase the amount of food that's produced, you have to deforest more and more. And so this kind of innovation is great because it's going to allow for more land use efficiency, less deforestation, and, uh, you know, ultimately, a, a, you know, a better carrying capacity for the whole world. So. And, and that'll get us into why Pierce hates organic food, but that's, that's for, that's for another, <laughs> another time, Nick, we've got two minutes left. Let's head to the last topic here. Uh, we've got, BlackRock filing Bitcoin spot ETF trust. What is it? Yeah, I think it's their entrance into a market where we've seen a lot of applications uh, for companies to put out a product that is, um, you know, wrapped spot Bitcoin in uh, and offer that to the the, the, the market. Um, what I think is interesting is, you know, obviously BlackRock has a lot of sway. They control, what is it, 10 trillion assets? They have 10 trillion assets under management. I mean, that's a mind boggling number in and of itself. But I found a pretty interesting stat when I was scrolling through Twitter. Uh, Eric Balchunas, he covers the ETF space. Uh, he noted that BlackRock is 575 and 1 when they file for an ETF. So they've only lost one uh, and they've only been. Uh, told no on one ETF. That ETF was in October 2014 when the company sought permission to create actively managed ETFs, and this is a kicker, that would not require disclosures of holdings on a daily basis. Um, anyone that knows the ETF world, it's built on transparency. Um, being able to understand what you're actually holding in these products is very important. Um, so it's not a big surprise, at least to myself that that was the one that they were told no on. Um, but, you know, when they do decide to throw their weight around in the space, it obviously is very meaningful. And that's why we wanted to bring it up. Sam, what are your thoughts? I mean, I think it's great. I think, you know, last week we talked about how it seemed like the SEC was acting uh, more political and trying to potentially overreach. And now you've got BlackRock coming out in support of crypto. Uh, Coinbase was the custodian listed. And, you know, uh, Gensler was going against Coinbase there. So the drama is coming, things are heating up. As we said, it's often at these turning points where you get, you know, regulation that lets the institutions come in. And here you have the institution coming in. So I think it's it's pretty exciting. Yeah, it feels like a win for Coinbase too. Like the fact that BlackRock picked Coinbase as their partner here, that just shows kind of their leadership in the space um, that they're going to be a trusted partner, so. Amazing, thanks for joining us for episode two of The Brainstorm. Uh, I think we covered a lot of ground and look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you, everyone.